This video is sponsored by CuriosityStream, home to over 2,500 documentaries and nonfiction titles for curious minds. Here we have the classic game of Snake, and you can think of this as a 2D snake living in its own little universe. But here's a question. What shape is that universe? Now, some of you probably said a square, and that's right. Yeah, this was not a trick question because, well, we can see it's a square with edges and a boundary that the snake cannot escape. All right, now what about this game of asteroids? What would you say is the shape of this universe? Here, some people will say a rectangle, and others will say a torus or a donut, which will cause the people who said rectangle to say, uh, what? But it's true in a way. Let's rewind, because notice there's no boundary this time. There's no edge that stops our character. After going through one side of the rectangle, we appear directly on the opposite side. And same goes for the left and the right. So how can we mathematically differentiate between a world with boundaries and one that has this wraparound effect? Well, for the boundaries, we can just show a normal square, no big deal. But for asteroids, we represent the universe like this. The different colored arrows are directly connected together. So if I go off the screen where the tip of this blue arrow is, I'll come back at the tip of the other blue arrow, just like in the asteroids game, and the same goes for the red ones. These are both directly connected. Now I actually drew the arrows on a sheet of paper on both sides, because instead of just saying, oh hey, this side's connected to this one, you go off here, you come back here, what if we were to physically connect them, physically connect this side to this one? Well, if we were to do that here, such that the arrows lined up, we'd at first get a cylinder, right? But now I still have to connect these arrows together. These sides were also connected, right? And in order to do that, I would have to physically you know, wrap the paper around itself, which I can't really do. It would crumble a lot if I tried. But if this were made of some stretchy rubber, for example, and I could do that connection, then we'd be left with a torus, as you can see here. So with that connection, the arrows would line up. And this is why the universe of the Asteroids game can be thought of as a torus, because they're topologically the same. These are not the same geometrically though. Geometry is concerned with things that change when you deform and morph an object, like angles, lengths, areas, curvatures, and so on. Since the torus is curved, and the object on the left, known as a flat torus, is not, they have different geometries, but their topologies are the same, because topology doesn't care about smooth deformations. It only cares about poking holes or tearing the surface, for example. And real quick, just note when we're discussing a torus, we're only referring to the surface. Because we can only play the game on a flat 2D surface, right? And the connections that we do don't change that. We're still only on the surface itself. There's no, there's no inside. So this remains a 2D manifold. It's just a surface, but it is embedded in 3D space. But now this opens us up to a new way of thinking about higher dimensions. We know this represents a torus topologically, so what would this be? Or this? Or this? If you've never seen this and want to think about it on your own, they go in order of difficulty. This one is the easiest as it's a cylinder. It says connect these two sides such that, again, those arrows line up. And we saw before that leaves us with a cylinder. But there are no arrows drawn on the other two sides, so we don't connect them. This would be topologically like a video game where you could go off the top and come back on the bottom, but the sides are actual boundaries that you cannot cross. Now this next one is new for us. Because it says we have to connect these opposite sides together, but not like before. So we try like before with the cylinder, then the arrows will be facing opposite directions. That's not allowed. They have to be facing the same way after doing the connection. So in order to make that possible, we'd have to do the same thing but put a half twist in the paper. I can't really do that with paper of this size. That's okay. So we can do it with this. 
So it's the same thing, just longer paper. Arrows are facing the opposite directions. And then if I do the connection here, again, we are left with a problem, but to resolve it, I can just put a half twist in the paper, and now the arrows are facing the same way. If we do the gluing, we're left with a Mobius strip, something we have seen before on this channel. So that fundamental polygon is a Mobius strip, which is a one-sided 2D manifold that is non-orientable. Because as I've shown before, an object that lives in that world and goes around once will come back completely inverted. This would be like playing a video game where going off the top right makes you reappear on the bottom left, but again, inverted. And whenever this is possible, whenever you can invert yourself while remaining in that space, then you're living in a non-orientable universe. And moving on, we have this last one here, which if you tried on your own with no prior knowledge, probably gave you a lot of trouble. Because what it says to do is connect these two sides, just like the cylinder, no issues there. But now we have to connect this side to this, such that these arrows line up. I have a copy of that which I taped so it's easier to hold. Now, Doing that would be very difficult because if I were to do the same, you know, wrap around here, the arrows would be pointing in the opposite direction, which is not allowed. But what we can do instead is take the bottom, which, which I cannot physically do, but I'm going to kind of demonstrate by cutting it off and moving it up here. So again, if I took this, I took this bottom and moved it up like that. The arrows are facing the opposite direction. So that's an issue. But what we can do instead is cut a hole in this thing and take this and move it through that hole. And now poke it up through the top and the arrows line up. So that's pretty much the best I can do with paper. But again, just imagine we have a cylinder from before, and then I have to take the bottom, pull it around, again, imagine it's stretchy rubber, pull it around, put it through a hole in the cylinder itself and through the top, such that the arrows are then connected. And if you were to do that with material that wouldn't tear or crumple, then you would get a Klein bottle. This is something we've also seen before, and you can see a better construction of it here. So topologically, this is a Klein bottle. And the only way a Klein bottle can exist in three dimensions is with self-intersection, which is what you see right here. But this object can exist without self-intersection if we had access to a fourth spatial dimension. That's where you'd find a true Klein bottle where this issue can be resolved. Note, this is still just a 2D manifold, still just a surface but this, a true Klein bottle, is embedded in 4D space. Now, I was talking to John from the YouTube channel Epic Math Time, who has been a huge help on these topology videos. Seriously, he has cleared up and fact-checked a lot for me, so definitely check out his channel, which is linked below. But after releasing one of my older videos, he told me to mention this the next time I bring out the Klein bottle in order to help with the issue of higher dimensions. When you look at this picture, you know, hopefully, that it's a 2D representation of a 3D cube. Even though there is self-intersection that exists on this picture, which doesn't for the cube. Like this edge physically intersects this one, there's self-intersection, or this edge intersects this one. The cube is intersecting itself in a way that doesn't happen here. These edges don't cross over one another. And the same thing can be said about this. We're looking at a 3D representation of a 4D object. Here we see self-intersection, just like here. But if we had higher dimensional brains, I could think about the four, a fourth spatial dimension, we would see that and be like, yeah, there's self-intersection, but clearly that doesn't happen for a real Klein bottle or a real cube. This is just a lower dimensional representation of a higher dimensional object. I had never heard that before, but I thought it was a great way to help people kind of come to terms with the self-intersection. Now, if I were to ask you whether this is orientable or not, 
That'd be pretty tough to answer without prior knowledge, unless you go back to the fundamental polygon representation, where you'll find just like with the Mobius strip, you will become inverted by going through the top or the bottom. So the Klein bottle is non-orientable. Okay, if you've noticed so far, we've only talked about 2D manifolds, and where we're headed is 3D manifolds that could represent our universe, and that's where things get really weird. But first, we need to talk about the product of shapes. As in, what's a circle times a line segment? Or a Klein bottle times a circle, and so on? Well, I'll tell you the first one. A circle times a line segment is a cylinder, and here's why. A cylinder can be thought of as either a line segment of circles, all these circles stacked linearly, or it can be thought of as a circle of line segments. It works both ways, which is why we can write this cylinder as a product of the two other shapes. And you'll notice that those circles are all perpendicular to the line segments. But here's a tougher one. What's a circle times a circle? And by circle, I just mean the points that make up the perimeter, not the inside. A circle, when just referring to the perimeter, is called S1 in the world of mathematics, so I can write the multiplication like this. Anyways, to answer this, we have to realize that this product symbol here really represents the Cartesian product of two sets, which isn't too hard to understand. If we have some set A made up of the numbers 1, 2, and 3, and then another set B made up of 4, 5, 6, then the Cartesian product of A and B is the set of all ordered pairs A comma B, where A is in A and B is in B. So the Cartesian product of A and B would include 1 comma 4, and 1 comma 5, 1 comma 6, 2 comma 4, 2 comma 5, and so on. It's just every point that includes something in here, comma something in here. What's cool is how similar this is to regular multiplication though. If you had to explain what 3 times 4 visually looks like, you'd say it's 4 rows of 3 of something, or vice versa. And the total number of items would be the actual answer. So the visual leaves us with a rectangular region of whatever, apples. Now look at all these ordered pairs in the Cartesian product set. Because if we were to plot those, we'd get, in this case, a square region. It's the same idea though. The first set was 1, 2, 3. So those are the only possible x coordinates or columns. Then the points are found in the rows, or for the y coordinates, 4, 5, and 6, which was the other set. So the Cartesian product left us with a rectangular region of points, but this isn't limited to just integers or finite sets. If set A was instead every single real number between 0 and 2, then set B was every real number between 4 and 5, the Cartesian product would be, well, every element in A, comma, every element in B. That means we'd have 0, comma, 4, 0.245 comma 4.671, 1 comma 4.3, and so on. Everything up to 2 comma 5. Or simply put, everything inside this rectangular region. You can think of this as all of the numbers in B, 4 to 5, just a thin sliver stacked on top of each element within A, from 0 to 2. By the way, for those who might not know, this is why the xy plane is called R2. It's the Cartesian product of the set of all real numbers with itself. All real numbers, perpendicular to all real numbers. Anyways, now it's time to find out the Cartesian product of two circles. What we're going to do is draw a line segment and say these two ends are connected by, I don't know, putting two little lines on the ends. This would be like a one-dimensional video game where running off one side brings you back to the other. It's just like the arrows from before, but arrows would be more confusing here, so I'm just going to use line segments. So what we have here is topologically a circle, or S1. Even though it's not shown, the ends are glued together, and thus we get this closed loop. Now we need to find the Cartesian product of this and another circle. 
But remember from before, to do this, you just take one of your sets, like zero to two, and then stack the other set, four to five, perpendicular to it, and then sweep across. So here, we'll stack another circle perpendicular to our first. I'll use dots this time to show that these ends are connected, so this is also a circle. Then we sweep across to get a rectangular region. Now, since each of these dots on the top is directly connected to the opposite, then we can just say this entire side of our rectangle is connected to that opposite side. And also, since this end was connected to this one from before, then we can say this entire side is connected to the opposite one. So, we have this rectangle where all opposite sides are directly glued, which can be represented by this fundamental polygon, which topologically we know is a torus. This is the Cartesian product of two circles. Because a torus is a circle of circles, or a different circle of circles. So that's the basic idea behind the product of shapes. It's amazingly similar to multiplying integers together. And with that, if you are now asked to find the product of a torus, written T2, and a circle, well, it's not too difficult. Just take a flat torus and stack S1, or a circle, perpendicular to it, where those ends are connected. Then do that throughout the entire torus, sweeping those circles across the entire thing until we get a cube. This is not a normal cube though, because opposite sides of the torus are glued, and all the circles going from the top face to the bottom had their ends glued as well. Which means that all the opposite faces of this cube are connected, leaving us with something called a three torus. Now, if you try to imagine physically connecting the opposite faces or the arrows together as if, like before, the cube were made of stretchy rubber, then you'll have some trouble because it requires a fourth spatial dimension. But this is still a 3D manifold and the first one of this video. 3D manifolds are where we start getting into possible topologies of our universe, where yes, this three torus is one that has been theorized. But that will be the topic of the next video, because this took way longer than expected. However, if you have a strong interest in space, physics, and cosmology, then you can learn a lot more over at CuriosityStream, this video's sponsor. What you're seeing here is called Stephen Hawking's Favorite Places, which is probably one of the most visually impressive series I've seen on this site. It's three videos narrated by Stephen Hawking, which show him going on a journey through space while he discusses some big ideas like black holes, parallel universes, quantum physics, and plenty more. This series covers some of the history of the universe, and also some of the biggest current ideas in physics and cosmology. And they have an entire category of their site dedicated to space and the universe, which is my favorite category of documentaries to watch. CuriosityStream is available on a variety of platforms worldwide, and it only comes out to $2.99 per month. But if you sign up by using the link below, you'll get your first month's membership completely free, so no risk in giving it a try. And with this, you'll have unlimited access to top documentaries that I'm sure many of you will enjoy. And with that, I'm going to end that video there. Thanks as always to my supporters on Patreon. Social media links to follow me are down below, and I'll see you guys in the next video.